and welcome to another episode of Talking Grassroots. I'm your host, Ricky Etridge, and joining me today, as usual, a different setting compared to normal. Ricky Logan, how are you today, mate? Yeah, good, mate. A little, little bit uh, sunburned and a little bit uh, tired from big day yesterday, but yeah. Yeah, I hear you. So down at Nations Footy Cup yesterday, and you speak of sunburn, and um, yeah, I... <coughs> I stuffed up. I probably should have uh, taken your advice when you went off to try and find some sunscreen. And I'm a fairly tan person, and I was like, ah, I don't need sunscreen. And forgetting that at some point during the day, I'm probably going to throw a singlet on, and the you can't see it, but my arms are about as red as a tomato at the moment. And as I told you before, woke my daughter up this morning, and she decided to scratch me straight down the arm on the sunburn. It was probably the uh, closest I've been to. Well, was I finished that one off? But uh, it was a good day. So yesterday. Uh, well, down at Nations Footy Cup, down in Diggers Rest Recreation Reserve. I uh, also a bit of. I'll run through the day, and then we'll sort of get stuck into what you enjoyed about the day. So, big day. Um, they're, they're very long days. These ones. I think I left here at about six thirty. Come and picked you up, um, then got down to Diggers Rest, probably just before eight. Um, everything set up. Everything working well. Um, day kicked off. Probably just before nine o'clock, which was good. They were running on time. Um, then throughout the day, everything running well, and then we had a bit of an issue with the uh, the generator that we hired and just decided to shit itself. Actually, I run out of fuel. Then we got it going again. And then once we got it going, it just sort of uh, shut itself. And I already I already told the uh, organisers that because they wanted it on Facebook, Facebook has an eight-hour stream limit, so there was going to have to be two sets of streams, and that was fine um, until the generator died and we then had no power. I was just lucky enough that you brought your backup laptop which is a fair which runs off battery power and is a fairly uh, a good one to have not plugged in and we then had to reload the stream onto that which cut the stream and then just out of nowhere the internet cut out so we lost another stream to get that going again and so besides that um, we, and then the four grand finals all really good games of footy um, and then we got out of there I think the last game finished about quarter past seven out of there by about 7.30, home by about 9. So when you're uh, leaving home at 6.30 and you're not home until 9 o'clock, they do make for very long days. But it was some really good footy. Um, what was your probably favourite part about the day yesterday? I think the granny between Malta and Lebanon after having a pretty hotly contested game earlier in the day um, that resulted in a controversial draw um, was pretty good and... When you're talking about higher quality football, they, the teams in Division One of the Nations Footy Cup have got some of the best local players going around, and Lebanon and Malta have some bloody good talent playing for them. And I tell you what, we've said it many a times watching this tournament. Tell these blokes that they're not playing for anything because they go as hard as anything. Um, uh, I like good physical, f- hard footballers, and that's what Lebanon and Malta have. They've got, um, they've got some guys that are very hard at it, but also classy on the outside. So it was a good, really good mix of footy. Um, the standard was second to none. It was uh, really good. Um, and then uh, in one of the sort of bottom divisions, you know, Division Three, um, there was uh, Afghanistan. One of the big forwards for Afghanistan, he probably stood out to me as the sort of dominant forward, as you would say, of the day, I reckon. Like uh, like I said, with Lebanon, Malta, some of these teams that had a lot of class and stuff, they still didn't really have like a big key forward that actually dominated their games or anything, whereas Afghanistan had a big guy that was down there with a big presence and sort of marked almost everything that went near him and, and then, you know, kicked kicked through the goals most of the times that he, he got his hands on it. Yeah, and I think a big thing with that too is the, um like, to about Division 1, like, it was all good quality footy, but Division 1 was like, it was, it was like you're out watching Eastern or Essendon District or the Mornington Peninsula Premier League's top table, top of the, t- top of the table teams. So they were fairly close games where Afghanistan were a really, really good team and they sort of, put teams to the sword pretty easily um, in their division. So I feel like that might have made him just look even better because he was being able to tear it up. But, you, you know, you can, as a full forward, I know very well, you can take the mark, you still got to get the goals. And he was doing that yesterday, the full forward of Afghanistan. Yeah, and, and not only, like, taking marks and kicking goals, he was bloody 
he was doing the Tommy Hawkins straight out of the ruck and snapping him. He was, uh, yeah, he was, he was quite impressive actually to to see a guy his size, the way he moved and play. Um, like I said, you know, when you're putting these teams together, you're probably just trying to get all the the best players you can from you know to represent your nation and stuff. And sometimes they end up with teams that don't really have guys to fill key positions. You end up with sort of you know half forwards. That are playing more, you know, yeah. having to fill in that full forward sort of thing like that. There's not, you know, there's a, there's a few big guys, but you know, you're the tallest bloke. You rock up, or we need a ruckman, so you're gonna have to ruck today. You where you know, you, might, you usually play centre half forward or centre half back or something. Yeah, that's a good point. I think one of the things that I um I find so impressive about the day and the quality of footy that is there is that for probably a hundred percent, maybe maybe not quite, but almost hundred percent of those players. That's their first hit out of the season since last year. And most clubs have, might, have, haven't really got the practice matches yet. You might have had a couple here and there, but their first real competitive footy, and it just shows that there's class across the board in that competition. Yeah, and there's there's also like there's some teams that are pretty scraped together sort of outfits that are you know there's guys playing in their ver- first tournament. They're, they're meeting the guys that they're playing with on the day haven't done any training together and stuff, where other teams have got to train together a few times. Or you've got the teams like Lebanon that, you know, they've got a, a core guy, group of guys that have played each every tournament. So they know what to expect. They know what they're doing. And, you know, like I said, the, the communication, everything about that, those Div 1 matchups, especially Lebanon and Malta, was first class. But when the guys are like, you know, get back, you get here, and they're directing and positioning where then you see some of the other teams that are like, there's no bloody talk whatsoever. You know, a guy's fisting it out of the bounds where he could have clearly taken a mark, and he's like, there was no talk whatsoever, where it just shows that there's guys that have played together a fair bit, they're comfortable, they know each other. And and some of these guys play together on Saturdays as well. You know, there'd, there'd be a few of those guys in Lebanon and Malta that play the same team or even you know play against some of these guys throughout the year so they sort of know each other a bit more and there's probably also that thing when you talk about blokes playing with each other there's probably blokes in those teams that during the you know their normal season they're playing with each other and then they rock up until a day like yesterday and they're actually you know playing against each other and everybody knows that we've played competitive sport our whole life when you get a chance to uh, beat your mate you, you tend to go harder than what you do trying to beat a bloke you don't even know yeah, and, and there was a good – this year there was no sort of, uh, you know, there was no fighter and there was a little bit – it got a little bit heated at certain points during the day, but there was no – nothing got out of hand, which was good. Um, you know, and like I said, you, you know, they're playing for a little cup and a, and a medal around their neck that, you know, literally means nothing. Yeah. It's it's a – you know, but when they're getting to put on this jumper that represents their country and, and – um, come together as a group of guys to play for for that. Um, they take this as serious as any any final or anything. That it's it's, uh, it's pretty good, and it, like I said, the quality is good. It, it's got some AFL talent coming to play, and I saw um, Mad Mad Jack Door played for the uh, Allies alongside uh, Prime Train, the Prime Train, the TikTok. He gave us absolutely nothing on our oval, and then like you. Yeah, so we'd done his, done his, I think it might have been his first game he'd done, and he couldn't get near it. He was he was sort of looking like just wanting to get at it, but couldn't quite do it. And was like, oh, he's giving us absolutely nothing here. Then you were chatting to uh, one of the other one of the boys that you knew down there, and he was saying that, oh, yeah, he tore us up, get a few snags on the other oval. And then I'd seen his uh, TikTok popped up this morning, and he's uh, just checked side one from the boundary line, which was quite frustrating. Didn't want to do that an hour over. But, yeah, then you had, you had a lot of talent. I mean, you had um, Radigalier's brother, play for Team Fiji, who got the chocolates in Division 2. Um, but yeah, back to what you're saying with you know, a couple of things got a little bit heated on field, but there was nothing major. With with these type of tournaments, you sometimes get that happen. Last year, there was a couple of incidents. I think every year there's been a couple of incidents. Last year, unfortunately, an off-field incident was sort of marred, marred the day. Um, but yeah, yesterday, from what we've seen, there was really only probably maybe two little scraps that really... It didn't even kick off. Like It was just a little push and shove, and that was really about it. And then the greatest thing about it, though, was once that sort of got broken up after about 20 seconds, the games went on as as normal, where 
in these type of games where there is really no um, no repercussions in weeks off during the during the normal season, you can always see a few people going to business for themselves and sort of want to keep keep going. And it was good not to see. And one thing I quite enjoyed um, was talk about prime train. Was I sort of expected a few blokes to get really stuck into him, being that he's this TikTok star, and you see it on the socials all the time. Blokes getting stuck into him. I thought it was really good that the team, when we watched them play Malta, I'm pretty sure we watched uh, them Lebanon. play. Lebanon, sorry. There was none of that. It was just, here's another player, go out there, play footy. So uh, it was a good day. So Division 3 and 2 were the first, I kicked off the day. And Division 3, Australia won, uh, won the title against Afghanistan. In Division 2, Fiji, in their fourth crack at it, finally got the chocolates, as I just said, and they bet. New Zealand. It was it New Zealand? Oh, it could have been New Zealand. I'm, it's yesterday all sort of merged into one at one point, but I think it might have been New Zealand. Just gonna have a no, quick. Uh, no, we'll go New Zealand. If we're wrong, Sewers. So um, and then the women's the women's grand final was Team New Zealand bet Team World, which was an absolute cracking contest. It was a, as we like to say in our in our world, an absolute barn burner. Um, and New Zealand come from behind and. New Zealand or World? New Zealand won it, weren't they? Yeah, uh, yep. yeah. New Zealand won it. Um, I'm pretty sure World won it last year. Yeah, so. I think World have won it the last couple of years. Um, and that was a good, great contest. At one point in the last about four minutes, I had a slight feeling we are heading into uh, extra time, which, I mean, it would have been great great to see, but at that point in time of the day, I, was, I did not want any extra, any extra footy to happen because, as I said, by that point, we'd already been there for about 10 hours and... Or sunburnt, or hot, um, and then the day wrapped up with Malta winning their first Division One. I'm pretty sure their first Division One championship against Lebanon. Yeah, and like I said, a, a cracking contest that one was. Um, that was pretty much the last. It was really up in the air to the last about 45 seconds. Yeah, it, yeah, definitely could have gone either way. And Malta, uh, I'm pretty sure Malta come from a couple of kicks, a couple of goals behind. Uh, I. Don't think they trailed by more than say eight points at. But, you know, oh no, so sorry. Yeah, they were goal behind, and then yeah, they were about eight points down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the the quality of those matchups was unreal, um, and you know we had Malta's bench right there in front of us, and you could see those guys really get into it, and um, you tell them they're not playing for for anything, and um, they they tell you you're wrong because they were just as passionate and. Uh, just as serious about this game of footy as any other one, um, and uh, you know, a few of those guys, even the coach, he was, it was the first time uh, at the tournament. He was asking us before they went out for their first match, how long are the quarters? Is their time on? So he, you know, he still was pretty fresh to it. Um, but I think they all enjoyed the day and had a had a cracking tournament. Yeah, it was just it, it was just a shame that during that like sort of that last two grand final periods where we had. Probably our biggest issue of the day with just our internet deciding for whatever reason it wanted to drop out, which, and then, as I said earlier, you know, with the generator dropping out. Unfortunately, when you are filming a live streaming events that you're relying on external power, you can have these issues. And it, um, obviously at Halfback Digital Media, we want to produce the best quality service we can. Uh, I felt like yesterday we did, and the issues that we had were outside of our control. And I think that's, I left there being a bit like, ah, oh, shit, we thought it was sort of a dog's breakfast in a way in the end. Um, I think we might have a guest coming over to see us. <laughs> no, she's going to have a nap. So just uh, break the fourth wall. We're filming this, recording this with my uh, daughter at home and she doesn't have a nap during the day and she's just put her iPad down and starting to lay down. So I could be in for a nice quiet afternoon. Anyway, back to what I was talking about. Yeah, when you're... um. Yeah, using external power, you don't have anywhere to just plug straight into a building. It does make it difficult. Um, but I thought, you know, the issues that you know, people look at it from the outside and go, oh, this happened, that happened, this happened. But what they don't see is the, and credit to you, the quickness of um, problem solving and making sure everything got transferred across to the other computer, set up, loading. Once the internet dropped out, you'll straight back onto it, get the new stream set up. And I think it was that quick that you got it done before you. We, I even noticed that it happened, which was so. Uh, that's credit to you, mate. But yeah, that, that's what happens. Usually, we prefer to film 
Well, especially especially days that long. When we're just sort of live streaming one or two games, very easy to do just off of battery power or anything like that. But when you're filming for, end up being about 11 hours in the end, um, it does happen. And the most the, the annoying thing, from, as I said to you yesterday, was if it, even if we had lost the power, the times that we were given the game, the day would go for, we would have been fine. And unfortunately, it ran about an hour and a half behind, which was what caused us issues. Is there anything else you want to speak about about Nations Footy Cup before we uh, move on, mate? Um, no, I was going to ask you, who who was your sort of standout for the day? If, uh, I know you're sort of keen to see the TikTok star prime train, but he... Oakland. We unfortunately didn't get to see his best match, um, but who sort of stood out to you? As... The, the one bloke that really... Stood out to me actually. I was, I'm pretty sure. I think it was in, I mean, the last game, the Maltese fullback that just kept cutting everything off as it was coming in. It was a sort of a bigger stock bloke, and he was, he moved like a bloody cat. He was, get, you know, reading the ball well, getting out there, and he actually really was a big reason why Malta ended up actually winning that game of footy. I'm pretty sure that's the right team I'm thinking about. Big fullback running off the full forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, uh, yeah, he was pretty good. Um, and oh, there was quite a few guys like that. But it's unfortunate because, as I did say earlier, like when you are filming that many games and you're up on the camera behind the stream, things going wrong, trying to work it out, it all does just slowly blend into just one yeah. long day of football. Yeah, and the thing is, sure. it could have been a player that we watched in that first game that I thought was an absolute cracker, but that's 10 hours and 12 or 13 games of footy. Since then, so but uh, what about yourself, mate? Any, anyone else that you really stood out for you? No, I think um, I'm pretty sure it was Saad for Lebanon was um, pretty pretty impressive, and in in all of their matches um, was yeah he was everywhere. And number one, I'm pretty sure it's Mo is his name. I think he was captain of uh, Lebanon. And I tell you what, that guy goes as hard as anybody I've ever seen play footy, and he's got some skills as well. He's a, you know, st- pretty stocky sort of guy, and I tell you, what, you would not want to get wrapped up in a tackle from him. Um, and then pre-game, uh, pre-grand final, Fiji and New Zealand, the Haka from the the New Zealand boys, and then the. I'm not too sure. It's a, it's a bit of a song that the Fijian guys do uh, in their huddle. Was it's good. It's always great to see the haka getting performed. Uh, it sort of gets the the uh, hairs on the back of the neck going, and uh, it makes you want to get out there and play. And um, yeah, so that I always love watching the haka live. It, it is a day where I think for the last four years, um, not so much last year, but because it is. So the first bit of foot local footy we see every every, every time we've gone down there, I've sort of been in that uh, footy still weeks away, um, and then you get you get there, watch the day of footy, and you're just like, I can't wait to get the training this week, and games are almost almost here. Where unfortunately, you know, last year um, didn't happen for obvious reasons, and then this year it's still. It's, I would love to be getting out there running around this week, but unfortunately, we're not. But there are is a big. Speaking of big days of footy, um, this Saturday we have what is being labelled as Super Saturday down at Coralin. Um, obviously, at the moment, mate, the cricket uh, for cricket action is still in full swing. So trying to get grounds for practice matches and on weekends at the moment is still quite difficult. You know, you sort of every club sort of fighting for the same ground. So Coralin of uh, pioneering a new local footy equivalent to gather around, this article says. And I actually knew about this a few weeks before this article got written, and I, then you mentioned it to me and actually triggered my memory. Like, oh, I've been meaning to talk about this for about three weeks. So this Saturday, um, so cricket, the handover between the cricket and footy club at Coralina is on March 1st. And the Cobras are wasting no time hosting its festival of football on Saturday to March the 2nd. So this, uh, this Saturday, you're going to have Hampton Park will play Karen Patterson Lakes. Coralyn will play Pearsdale and the Pines will play Altham. So big, you know, that's some very good teams down there running around. And yeah, netball will take place too with a round robin featuring Pearsdale, Bunyip, Neerham South and Coralyn. Uh, so this, the uh, Rowan Marriott, the Coralyn president, goes on to say, 
He wanted to put on an exhibition of local footy. We've got a, a pretty good oval out there, so we're going with Super Saturday, he said. We're trying to put an exhibition of local footy. Grounds are hard to find. We have a very good grounds. So we thought we'd showcase our ground and the club and reckon there's a market there. We plan to do it annually. Paddy Swan, the Pines coach, has been very helpful with it, and I rang Brad Canavan, uh, the CPL coach, and he said, leave it with me, and the next day he had Hampton Park. Marriott reckons the Festival of Footy concept is a market untapped and hopes to become a part of Coralyn and local footy calendar. Uh, it goes on to say a bit more, but we won't go into it. I think this is an absolute brilliant idea on so many levels. Um, as I said before, grounds are hard to come by. Um, it gives multiple teams a practice match. It helps. Um, you know, so five of these clubs just pretty much just sit there and go, okay, we've got a practice match on. There's only one club that need to worry about getting the ground right. It saves on the costings of, you know, line marking and stuff like that. And above all, it's um, an absolute brilliant way for Coralyn to put money in the bank with their canteen and their bar and actually, you know, getting set up for the season. Yeah, the, we've spoken about Coralyn before as, you know, we – they're a club that we speak highly of and always have a lot of respect for what they do. They've um, For a club that's in such a little small part of the world to sort of keep achieving what they're able to achieve is a credit to everyone that's involved in that club. And um, this is just another testament to that, to come up with this idea, um, you know, to get all these other clubs involved and, and you know, like you said, clubs like Carrum and... Pearsdale and Pines, you know, probably can't even get on their grounds f- to play any games. You know, they're probably running around um, in runners at the moment when they're allowed to and things like that. So to actually get a game in and, and yeah, get this festival going, it'll be good to see it grow year after year. And I'm sure there'll be many of other clubs trying to get involved or uh, trying to start their own thing, doing the same sort of thing. I know even uh, the Supers Club I'm involved in is sort of, floated the idea of doing something similar with a couple other teams to try and get some practice matches for ourselves. I've, I'd be amazed if by 2025, there's a handful more than by 2026, if we're not getting a day of eight or nine of these running around. Like this day, it spreads across, well, football-wise, it spreads across five five leagues. So you've got the West Gippie League of Bunyip, uh, sorry, of Coralin, you've got Hampton Park, which is southern... Karen, P, uh, Karen Patterson Lakes, which is southern, Pearsdale, Mornington Peninsula, and Eltham, or Pines Peninsula, and Eltham, uh, northern. And actually, so it even spreads across a couple of divisions of southern and Mornington as well. And then in the netball, you've got Mornington, um, West Gippy, Allen Bank, and another West Gippy. So three leagues in the netball as well. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And one thing um, which this... Uh, this type of thing I love seeing on social media. I've seen a couple of clubs that I saw, I saw Coralyn do this um, the other week. I've seen Barwon Heads Football Network Club do this. The days where these country footy clubs put on working bees and you get pictures of blokes and women getting stuck into their club and doing things that most people probably wouldn't even have an idea that this is how clubs are run. Most people, and I was guilty of this in my first probably 10 years of senior footy, you rock up at the start of the season, you do your pre-season, um, normally you probably don't really have rooms because the cricket club have rooms, and then you walk in, everything's on the wall, everything's clean, everything's done, and you think, oh, that's how it works. But there's a lot of lot of time and usually a lot of people, manpower, woman power, go into getting footy clubs up and running and to be able to host a season, to host a day like today? Oh, for sure. There's a lot of work involved in it. Um, and like I said, you know, all the other clubs involved would just be jumping at the opportunity that Coralyn has put on for them. And, you know, hopefully they repay that by getting a fair few people down to watch them play and putting some money over the bar and uh, through the canteen if they're able to, to run that. And... It, you know, it, a lot of it comes down to having good relationships with the cricket club as well. Yeah. Um, some of these country clubs, and uh, you know, even a lot of the metro clubs that have shared rooms with cricket and footy don't always have the best of relationships. It, it is kind of, a, um, uh, you know, it can be tension there at the best of times with clubs, you know, sort of 
thinking you're trying to take something from them or whatever. But when clubs are able to work together better and have great relationships and even, you know, if there's players that play for both cricket and footy and work together, it just makes things so much easier and it, and it works so much better. Um, but, yeah, you do get that, unfortunately. I, th- I think the world would be a much better place if footy and cricket clubs could just get along all over the place. But before we move on, just uh, back to my little thing I said before about, you know, it takes a lot of people to get clubs up and running. If you're listening to this and you just sort of have that same mindset as I did about just you rock up and play, put your hand up, do some stuff, you'd be amazed how appreciative clubs are when people put their hands up. And normally the people that are doing all the work are the, the older generation that are getting ready to step back. And if the young blokes don't put their hand up and step up, then clubs are going to fall on their ass, unfortunately. But uh, some great news coming out of the uh, the VAFA. Now, we are involved at a club that... Um, Unfortunately, we had to drop back to a thirds competition back in 2019. Long-term goal was to try and get ourselves back in divisional football. Unfortunately, riding was on the wall and that we, we discovered that was probably going to be impossible. Um, but Chadston have done it. They've managed to go from the Vaffa thirds uh, where they start. I think they dropped to thirds in 16, I think it was. Um, yeah, so 2016, they were in divisional. Then they dropped to a thirds team. 2024, so eight years later... They've managed to turn their fortunes around during probably the worst period in local footy with COVID and all that type of stuff. And Chad's then going to move back into Division 3 of the Victoria Amateur Football Association. Yeah, it's, it's a great story to hear. It uh, always takes a lot of hard work. And, um, you know, we've we've played played a couple of practice matches against Chaddy over the years. So it's good to see them be able to get back uh, to divisional football. And I wish them all the best. Hopefully um, this time around they're sort of, you know, built – things a bit better and they've got some uh, momentum so that when they do go back in there it's it uh, they're back there to stay yeah it's um it, it's fantastic to see and you know um when, when you talk about clubs dropping to a third most people will see that that's that's it sort of once they go to a thirds competition that there's no way back up um Chadson have done have now done it. Nary Nary South Nary South Saints, who were originally old Xavier Francis. St. Francis. St. Francis, sorry. Did it. I think this is great. It's great for the Amos as well. You know, the Amos have lost a couple of uh, teams recently. Now they're bringing back in a team. Uh, and from all reports, it sounds like the uh, Amos were very helpful and, you know, were willing to let them take their time to do it. And that's very important. I think a lot of leagues, we experienced in the Southern with uh, Lee Hartman, the CEO of Southern at the time, who still is the CEO down there, um, was very patient, welcoming. Um, I'm sure there would have been some people that were telling him, just get rid of them. We don't need a thirds team. I could be wrong, but just in case there was. But Lee stuck that and, you know, God has helped us through as well as Travis Switzer uh, was another one that really helped the club. And they didn't put pressure on us. Um, you know, you the thing that, and obviously coming from this experience, I think an issue, you know, one thing I hope that a Chadston didn't have to experience was the, the amount of shit talk that, that your club gets when you drop into a thirds competition. We copped a, a lot of it. Uh, I don't mean to make this about the club that we're at, but we, we went through a period, it was the whole time we were playing thirds footy, oh, you're a senior team playing thirds, you should be winning flags, where in reality, if you look at that list that we had in that when we first started playing, Every single one of those players, when they come to the club, were playing thirds. What had happened was the year that we, the last year we had there, we had blokes playing seniors who just had no, that, no disrespect, shouldn't have been, wouldn't have got to get seniors anywhere else. All right, we're back. Sorry about that. Just a uh, little hungry child. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm hoping that they didn't cop what we copped, and they did great, good on them for getting out there and getting themselves back into divisional football and. Hopefully they have a good year. You know, obviously the restructure of the um, VAFA this year and obviously Masala dropping out of that division now, um, I reckon VAFA would have been just so accommodating and so happy when Chadson said that they were going to come back in. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, like I said, it's always good for a club to be able to um, bounce back from that. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that as of yet. But, um, yeah, I wish them all the best and it's good to see that you know they've they've had a president who's came on and you know he's well the sounds of it he's come on with a plan to try and get them back to where they needed to be and um, put in all the work and done all that stuff and had a good team behind him by the looks of it so 
Yeah, I wish him all the best. And, you know, one of our best memories of Chadston is playing against him in a pracky match and having one of the all-time great sledges um, thrown over the fence from one of our boys, which makes zero sense, but it was still a classic. I wouldn't really uh, call it a classic, but uh, I've got to move on. I've got something on. All right, we'll touch on just one more thing before we wrap this up, mate. And uh, this is back from uh, a couple of weeks ago now. So a Victorian league in Melbourne's northwest could ban tackles which bring players to the ground in its under-10s competition. The Essendon District Football League is also considering changing its junior competition structure to prevent under-10s from playing for premiership points in 2024 competition. It may also seize playing finals and will stop presenting league goal kickers and best and fairest awards. It plans to continue keeping scoring on the tens matches, but not display them online. Uh, a few, you know, it goes on to say, you know, people reckon it's basically kick to kick, and um, it's about teaching. You know, they've, yeah, you know, yeah, comments online. Oh, this the world's going soft. It's woke. It's this. It's that. I'm 30, 34 this year. W- when I was not under nines on tens, we didn't tackle. We didn't have fun. We had a lightning premiership. There was no ladder. We didn't like scores were kept, but weren't displayed. But now people are trying to say the world's getting soft. Well, was the world soft twenty years ago when I was playing that level of footy? Yeah, I guess it's you know difference between some of the leagues, some of the leagues that hadn't adopted those styles in the past, of now finally catching up to what others were doing for a long time, and that's probably where you know the confusion comes from like oh you know we've gone soft like no there's other leagues that have done it for I'm a long pretty time. sure Essendon I think I was reading Essendon's you know Essendon District's the only league that um does that and I didn't really know much about the junior side of Essendon District until I started doing the social media work for a few clubs out that way and I was getting their junior results in and getting results for under 10s I was like oh that's a little bit strange and they had finals for under 10s and I was like oh when I was on the 9s on the 10s we just had you know, you kept scores. Um, you had to, you could only bump, which I feel like now they're probably looking at it and going, "Oh, but we can't say you can bump." Um, I think you know the, you can't tackle to the ground. I mean, there's going to times it's going to happen. There's going to be discretion, discretion of our oh, did he mean it? Did they not mean it? But I, I don't think it's an issue. And I think with you know you look at um, how footy is nowadays and all these things. And we'll chat about it next week. The Vaffers 28 day concussion protocol they want to bring in and. Um, the unfortunate retirement this week or last week of Brayshaw with the concussion. I think it's smart by the EDFL to try and just protect the kids from hurting themselves and getting injured too early. These days, people just want to jump on the oh, the world's going soft in my day, in my day, in my day. Well, in my day, as I said, under nines, under tens, we didn't have premierships, we didn't tackle it was bump. Like it's their kids. Like yeah, you know, someone's saying it's you know it's basically. Kick to kick. Have you ever gone to watch under nines and under tens play? Yeah, it's it's basically that anyway. It, there is no need to be tackling in that in, in that age. Like it's just it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I, I can understand people getting you know, right up about it, but there's more important things in local footy to be right up about than one competition falling in line with pretty much every other competition in the state. Yeah, and that's 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 the thing. Like you, like you said, you see some of the quotes from people and you know. One of the quotes here is just let the kids play. And that's exactly right. Like That's all they're trying to do is let the kids play footy without, you know, the uh, physicality that under-10s don't need. Like you don't need to, to tackle in that age because kids, most kids don't know how to do it properly. They, you know, there's kids that out there that are, they're a great kick of the ball, they're a great handball and stuff, but they don't know how to tackle, they don't, you know, they don't know how to protect themselves when they're getting tackled and things like that. So let the kids develop and stuff, develop their skills because at the end of the day, you want kids to develop good fundamental skills. And when you're worrying about tackles and all this other, you know, premiership points and all this stuff, like none of that's relevant at that age. Like at 50 years old, you're going to be talking about a premiership you won in under 10s. Like who gives a shit? I mean, it, it, you know, I guess as a 10-year-old, you know, when, when you are playing for, like, I can speak from my experience at 10, you all you wanted to do was win. It, it It's born into you normally. But I look back on it now as a 33-year-old, turning 34, and I'm just like, you're playing kids' footy. Like, it's under nines, it's under tens. It's 
most of most of blokes, most blokes, most of players, whether boy, girl, that are playing under nines and under tens footy, that you know, you might have one or two, or, and out yeah, of the whole league that can actually kick the ball further than 10 metres. And most of the time, these kids haven't developed their skill enough yet. And that's what the kids, the, t- the coaches are trying to do. And that's what it goes on to say in this article. It says that, you know, um, you know, no scoring takes the pressure off coaches to not only to not have to play their best players. It, it then gives other kids a chance to play and develop. And, you know, when you keep a score at that age, you might have the issue where you've got that kid that's just not, not quite that good that's getting put on the bench in close moments where... And he's going to... F- you know, if he doesn't love footy, he you might he might be lost to the game completely because at that age he's not skilled enough to kick a footy fifteen meters. But some kids I know blokes that I played with in under thirteens, fourteens who are like, you know, sort of um probably the bottom six or seven players in our team go on and play top level senior football because they they grew and their skills got better in that sort of thirteen to eighteen. So under tens is it's, it's nothing. Yeah, exactly. The, the sole focus, is, like, you're a step away from Auskick. Most of these kids are still you're doing, doing Auskick, yeah. you know. So Auskick's about developing skills. Most of these kids, the the highlight's going to be that day they get to run out on the MCG and have a little five-minute match that, you know, in, in front of a crowd and stuff like that. That's probably going to be the highlight of their footy time at that age, um, you know, winning a game against, uh, you know, Teams three suburbs over, like they're not going to remember that a year or two down the track, let alone uh, lifelong memories. But the skills that they develop at those times, they're the things that can work. And if you've got a kid that's ten years old who's an absolute gun who out can outplay all these ten year olds, and he's not getting enough out of it, he goes up and plays up at yeah. age. That's you know, there's you hear about all the time these guns of kids that end up playing under 13s and he's only 11 years old or whatever and then and so on and so forth you know most of the jets that have uh, you know at under 18s they, they were playing there at 15 16 already yeah um so it's not it's not telling kids you know if you're 10 years old you've got to play under 10s and that's it if you're good enough and you've got the skills already developed you can play up an age and um you know yeah it's it's about having the game open to as many kids as possible and, and encouraging as many kids as possible to play it. And, uh, and I'm fully for it. I understand all of it. And I think also, yeah, you know, these, yeah, you know, you're going to have, under 10s, you're going to have, you know, little, little players coming up against, like my experience, I was always, like, I was, by 10, I was a foot above everybody else. I was already a big boy. And I was playing against blokes that, Half my size, and you know, I can understand that you know they wouldn't want to go out there and play. Imagine rocking up and playing against a bloke twice your size. I think it makes it, it makes just makes it more inclusive for everybody. And I think people just sort of need to see a little bit more. You know, when we, but you know when we're getting you know, under 15, 16s, where if it gets over ten girls, that pulls the scoreboard down. And that I have issues with. Like just that's where winning and losing does come into it. But anyway, I reckon we'll wrap this one up. So once again, thank you for joining us on Talking Grassroots. Um, uh, we're getting close to the start of the season, so if you need any, you know, your game week social media taken care of, uh, match filming, live streaming uh, for games coming up, get in contact with us at uh, Halfback Digital Media on the socials or info at halfbackdigitalmedia.com via email. And uh, Rifty, mate, I'll see you next week. No worries. See you then.